Thank you for joining us today for the Ole Foundation's webinar, Blenderized Tube Feedings, Hands-On Learning with Registered Dietitians and Patients. Our thanks to Nestle Health Sciences for generously sponsoring this webinar and to our speakers for offering up their time and expertise. I am Lisa Metzger, the Ole Foundation's Director of Community, Community Engagement and Editor of our bi-monthly newsletter. I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'd like to offer a few words about the Ole Foundation for those who may be unfamiliar with us. The foundation was founded in 1983 by Dr. Lynn Howard and her patient Clarence Ole Oldenburg to enrich the lives of people on home parenteral or IV nutrition, also called HPN or TPN, and enteral nutrition, also called tube feeding. We do this through education and programs such as this one, as well as outreach and networking. Today, Oli serves over 26,000 members with a variety of programs, all of which are free to patients and their families. You can learn more about us at oli.org. That's O-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. If you have questions for the speakers today, please use the Q&A function. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A period, which will follow our last presentation by Laura, Lauren. And this is the agenda for today's webinar. We'll do our best to stick to the times indicated. And again, note that the Q&A will follow Lauren's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Lisa Epp is an advanced practice dietitian at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and assistant professor of nutrition at Mayo Clinic, Mayo, I'm sorry, Mayo College of Medicine and Science. Lisa is a member of the American Society for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or ASPEN, and currently co-chairs Aspen's Entral Committee. Lisa recently joined the Ole Foundation's Board of Trustees, we're very happy to say. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that introduction. We have a lot of information to get through, so um, I'm gonna just quickly go through my disclosures here on to our objectives. So um, today we want to review some history related to blenderized tube feeding, review some of the benefits that we've seen in the literature and in practice, review different formula options, and discuss how we as patients and dietitians can collaborate more on this um, kind of up and coming practice. So what is blenderized tube feeding? Really what it is, is taking blended foods and liquids making them a consistency that can go through a feeding tube. Sometimes it can contain modulars, sometimes it can have commercial formulas, but in general, it's just taking food and water and blending it together. There's not really a standard definition for blenderized tube feeding, and so you may also see it referred to as homemade tube feeding, whole food tube feeding, real food tube feeding, food-based tube feeding, or pureed diet via gastrostomy tube. So let's look back at early enteral feeding. You know, 3,500 years ago, when rectal feeding was first seen, um, we thought that there was enough, enough absorption through the GI tract if um, foods were given rectally. And this was done with glass and wooden types of tubes. Um, and the first formulas were things like broth and milk and eggs mixed together. Really, nasal feeding tubes did not become popular until the late 1800s, and it wasn't until 1960 that we actually had the gastrostomy tubes and jejunostomy tubes that we um, kind of are familiar with today. You'll see this date again here in a minute, um, which makes a lot of sense for what we're talking about today. So blenderized tube feeding in history, like I mentioned, we first um, have seen evidence of using rectal feeding in ancient Egypt 3,500 years ago. But really the first kind of blenderized formula that was administered into the stomach was in the late 1700s. And this was a mixture of jelly and eggs and sugar, milk and wine. Um, and actually even President James Garfield received rectal feeding for almost two months after his assassination attempt in 1881. It wasn't until um, 1960, again, you heard that um, year with the, the modern tubes that we have, that um, commercial formulas were introduced to the market. So until 1960, all we had was blending up food and liquid and putting them through tubes. 
once those formulas became more popular um, after 1960, 1970, um, we started to see some early publications in the 2000s that kind of highlighted the microbial contamination and risk for foodborne illness when we mix food and liquids together. Um, so the practice of blenderized tube feeding kind of dwindled a bit at that time. In 2010, approximately, that's when I consider modern day tube feeding was um, resurrected. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. So how many people are doing blenderized feeding at home? Um, with our friends at the Oli Foundation, we did um, send out this survey to um, via the online platforms and got response, good response back. So pedi in pediatric patients, we had 125 respondents and about 90% of those patients were using blenderized tube feeding in some capacity. Um, and 75% of them were using homemade blends. When it comes to the adult population, it was a little bit less. About 66% of the respondents were using blenderized tube feeding for about half of their total intake, but more of them were using commercial products. Um, and this was a self-reported survey, but um, they, the participants did self-report that they were um, using commercial enteral formula was more likely to lead to weight loss than when they were using the blenderized feeding. Now, one could argue that Oli um, members are savvy consumers and might be more apt to be using blenderized tube feeding. So um, some of the large infusion companies, Quorum and Pediatric Home Services, helped us disseminate this survey more globally, along with Oli and Tube Feeding Awareness Foundation. And we got over 1,500 respondents, which I feel is a little bit more indicative of the actual demographic of blenderized tube feeding. So for pediatrics, you know, we, we found that about 24% of pediatrics were using blenderized tube feeding and about 15% adults. And again, I feel like that's a little bit more in line with the national trends. So let's look at what do dietitians think? You know, we have this perception that um, blenderized tube feeding is going to take a lot of work to help our patients sometimes. Um, and so we wanted to kind of look at what does the literature say? Um, and dietitians responded to this survey, um, two studies by Teresa Johnson out of Troy University. Um, so to about 2,500 dietitians responded and over half of them are recommended, recommending blenderized tube feeding. However, the most common reason was because the parent asked them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about dietitians here in a minute. The second survey is, was really asking parents um, about blenderized tube feeding. And the concerning thing in this survey, the second survey that was of parents was that only half of them were referring to a registered dietitian for oversight of their feeding. And um, we might see some light into why here on the next slide. So challenges are really that um, dietitians don't have formal education on blenderized tube feeding. You know, we um, don't learn about it in school very much. We may have experience in our internship if our um, institution supports it, but most of our education is going to come from our own independent learning on like webinars such as this. Um, so there's this limited perceived competence on the blenderized tube feeding practice. And that's really what we want to change by increasing educational opportunities. So why would you want to even consider blenderized tube feeding for yourself if you're the patient or for your patient if you're a dietitian? So there's really kind of two sets of benefits that I see. One set is psychological, like improved quality of life, um, personal preference, and just really that patient-centered care, um, increased patient satisfaction and increased caregiver satisfaction. Also decreased healthcare utilization. Then we have this other bucket of benefits that are more physical, such as improved bowel function, um, improvement of the gut microbiome, decreased retching and gagging, thicker consistency might help with volume intolerance. So in general, there's kind of those two sets of benefits, but you can see it's a pretty extensive list. So let's look at what we have seen in the literature recently. 
you know, really initially we only had a sprinkling of a few studies all done in pediatrics that were showing us some of these clinical benefits of using blenderized feedings. So in this first study, um, which was kind of one of the first studies that um, referred to modern day tube feeding having benefits, 33 children were given um, primarily a commercial um, mixture of baby foods and commercial formula to make a pretty thick blenderized feeding. And as you can see there, you know, 52% had decrease in gagging, 73% um, had overall decrease in symptoms, and surprisingly, there was an increase in oral intake amongst these children. Then we move on to the next study where 10 children with short gut were given a um, liquid commercial product made with food ingredients. Um, and all and nine of them were able to transition off of an elemental formula onto that formula with improvement in stooling and thus improvement in hydration. Third, we have a study where 17 of a group of 20 children were given a Vitamix and a specific homemade blenderized recipe where they were um, using home blends at, um, without any commercial products. And you can see here that the prevalence of vomiting decreased, the um, prevalence of good bacteria in the gut increased, and overall the caregivers were much more satisfied and unanimously said, I would absolutely recommend blenderized tube feeding um, to other people. Lastly, here we have a study in which the patients were on either a commercial blenderized product that was in a pouch or homemade blenderized tube feeding. Um, and there were 42 um, patients that were on that type of feeding compared to 28 on just the standard commercial formula. And as you can see here, not only were, was there increased quality of life, but there were lower scores on the pediatric um, gastrointestinal symptoms scale. So less vomiting, less abdominal pain, less diarrhea. Um, but as you can see, this was really over a 10 year span. And each of these studies used a different type of blenderized tube feeding. So it's not really one size fits all and we're still seeing the clinical benefits. Moving on to the last two years, obviously, as you can see here, we're seeing a lot more publications related to the um, benefits of blenderized tube feeding. But again, they are mostly in pediatric patients. This is a really nice table that kind of lists some of the top papers that show clinical benefits and then could kind of give you an idea, well, of, of that study, which symptoms were improved? Well, you can see pretty much, well, everyone had a, an improvement in reflux and an improvement in vomiting, and almost everybody had an improvement in um, bowel function. But you can see um, growth or quality of life was a little bit um, sporadic throughout the studies. <clears throat> So like I mentioned, most of the studies have been done in pediatric population. Our group did um, just a small pilot study where we gave a blender and specific recipes to a group of patients and sent them home to do home blenderized feeding for six weeks. And basically what we found is that it was safe, it was effective in either promoting weight gain or weight maintenance, if that was the goal. And none of the patients had infection or any symptoms of foodborne illness during that time. So I just wanna briefly touch on NFITS because I think some people have worried that um, as we um, transition in the United States to NFIT that it might prevent some people from using blenderized tube feeding. Um, so we did a study um, back in 2019 where we compared some commercial products, Jevity, Nourish, Real Food Blends, compared to some Mayo Clinic blenderized recipes. And we blended those recipes using different blenders with different amounts of times at three and six minutes and tested all of those formulas through tubes from 14 to 24 French. With our, um, with our orthopedic lab, we were able to then put this formula in a syringe and test how much force it took to push the syringe when those formulas were in there. And as you can see from our results here, um, the blenderized formula, the Mayo recipe, revealed that legacy tubes actually had a lower syringe um, force needed only for one tube, only for the 14 French tubes. 
all the larger tubes, there was really no difference between NFIT and the legacy tubes, which are the tubes that we might be um, using right now. Um, when we looked at the impact of size of the tube, blender, how long we blended, whether it was legacy versus NFIT, really what we found in this study is that tube size, blender used, and blending time were much more significant in affecting the force needed to push the syringe compared to legacy versus NFIT was not significant. Regression analysis also revealed that variables such as formula, and like I mentioned, tube size, blender, and time of blending really has more impact on compression force than anything else. So the FDA decided to repeat a similar study. However, this time they took five different blenderized tube feeding recipes that they had gotten um, from consumers and they ranged from very thin to very thick. And what they found um, when testing through 14 to 24 French tubes again is that for a slower push, a 60 second push, that less effort would be required to push that syringe with NFIT than it was with the legacy, the current tubes. But for a very fast push, a lot more force would be needed to push those thicker formulas through the NFIT tubes. When it comes to low profile tubes, they found that the NFIT version of the extension sets required less, less force, regardless of fast or slow pushing. Um, and assuming that patients don't typically intentionally make a super, super thick diet, which was one of the diets they tested, the enchilada diet, um, and don't push extremely quickly, that most people using syringe feeding will not require more fo force to push their blenderized tube feeding through the new NFIT devices. So really what I want you to know, a takeaway about NFIT is, Again, for push method of feeding with a syringe, patients will be largely unimpacted by the transition to NFIT. But as we are gonna hear more about today, overall blenderized tube feeding is very individualized and follow-up is recommended at the time of transition from a legacy tube to NFIT, just to make sure that no modifications need to be made. Okay, so like I mentioned, people do worry about clogging when it comes to blenderized feeding. And um, again, with our friends at Oli, we were able to survey um, about over a thousand or right about a thousand um, members and found that in the pediatric population that those had, had changed to NFIT already compared to those still using the legacy or the kind of old style of tubes. Um, the NFIT users had less um, disconnection from their feeding tube. Um, they had slightly higher clogging rates um, in the pediatric population and no difference in kinking with either type of tube. In the adult population though, um, there was no um, difference in clogging. There was less disconnecting of feedings um, with the NFIT tubes compared to legacy. However, there was more frequent incidence of tube kinking. So how do we take this patient-centered approach and kind of move forward with working with our patients? You know, we have a, over 130 formulas. If you look at the Aspen formula guide and you might be thinking, where do I even start? What I like to do with my patients and say, what types of foods did you eat before? Or what type of food does the family eat? And then maybe start to talk about the options. I realized that when hospitalized, it's hard to have a patient or a caregiver be part of that initial formula selection, but definitely involve the patient when possible so we can continue to provide patient-centered care. So like I mentioned before, it's just food and water. We're taking food that the family might be eating for dinner, putting it in a blender and making it a consistency that can go through a feeding tube. But there's really many options of doing this. And so um, I have listed here some of the options. Someone might wanna just blend a few foods into a, com a standard commercial formula. They went strawberry picking with their family today and they want 
um, their family member who is too fed to get some strawberries blended into their commercial formula. That might be an option. Um, using a food-based tube feeding formula or commercial blenderized formula and adding foods that maybe aren't in that product that you want to get. Using just a commercial, commercial blenderized formula, doing all home blending or somewhere in, be in between. It's not one size fits all. So really exciting will be um, Aspen clinical recommendations for blenderized tube feeding will be published ho hopefully um, later this um, summer or early fall. And what I would encourage you to look for there, there's just going to be lots of great um, information. We had a great group of multidisciplinary group working on this product project for over a year. Um, but what you're going to find there is how do you consider um, the choice between using a homemade blend and a commercial blend? What tubes might be recommended? What would be the ideal blenders? How do you do this in the hospital? How do you make sure that your feedings are at appropriate consistency so they don't clog the tube? There's going to be sample recipes there and much, much more. So I think it's going to be really helpful for clinicians, but also for patients as well. So with that, I'm going to leave you with my references, and we will look forward to Robin's talk here in just a minute. Thank you, Lisa. That was terrific. Our next speaker will be Robin Cook. Robin is a pediatric surgical trauma dietitian at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Robin has more than 15 years of experience in the field of pediatric surgical and trauma nutrition, including extensive knowledge in both parenteral, or IV, nutrition, and enteral nutrition, or tube feeding. In her role, at CHOP, Robin uses advanced counseling and clinical skills in the management of complex pediatric surgical patients, including those with congenital surgical anomalies and those who have suffered traumatic injury. Among many other things, Robin develops original comprehensive nutrition support plans. She is winner of the 2020 Department of Clinical Nutrition Innovator Excellence Award related to her work in creating the blenderized tube feeding recipe builder, which you'll learn more about in Robin's presentation. Welcome, Robin. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. So just a quick slide on my disclosures here that I did create the blender ice cube feeding recipes that you're gonna see um, in the presentation. These were licensed to Nestle Health Science uh, and under my institution's policy, I will be entitled to a share of any royalties though to date I have not received anything of value. So you heard from Lisa just about the benefits of blenderized tube feeds, uh, and we're gonna start this part of the presentation by just how to determine whether or not your patient is an appropriate candidate for blenderized feeds. Not all patients are. And what I wanna say from this point forward is we're really gonna be speaking about homemade blenderized feeds, not commercially available products, which are appropriate for most individuals. So we have this handy little moniker that we came up with CHOP, with a CHOP which just goes through some of the uh, questions, the most commonly questions that are answered, how you deal with it, what's a green flag, what's a red flag, and then essentially how you're gonna deal with any of the red flags. So keeping in mind that I work in pediatrics, this is gonna be all for children under the age of 18, though some of the information is certainly applicable to the adult population. So first, the child's age. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends breast milk or infant formula as a sole source of nutrition through six months of age, at, wh at which points complementary feeding begins. Typically speaking, around nine months of age is when complementary feeds start to make up a significant source of calories, and you really start to see the amount of breast milk and infant formula decrease. So we recommend waiting until the child is greater than nine months corrected age, if the baby was premature, for supplemental sources of nutrition, and then greater than 12 months of age when blenderized feeds are the sole source of nutrition. Patients should be medically stable with appropriate weight gain. They should not be immunocompromised or undergoing any immunosuppressive therapy. Some red flags for that meaning they are unstable. So a patient, for instance, who is admitted to the intensive care unit would not be a patient that really is appropriate to begin blenderized tube feeds. One who is immunocompromised, uh, for instance, a patient undergoing a bone marrow transplant, if they lack adequate weight gain on their current regimen, or if they just have a number of dietary restrictions. So renal, keto, metabolic, et cetera. That actually doesn't mean you can't do the blends. It just means that 
that there's a little more uh, thought that needs to be put into them. And they really should be done with a dietitian in one of those specialties. As for tube, the patient should have a G-tube. The G-tube site should be well healed and the first G-tube change should have been completed. The reason for that really is that in the first six to eight weeks, depending on which surgeon you talk to, um, the tract is not quite healed, meaning that if the tube comes out accidentally, there, the abdominal wall can move away uh, from the stomach wall and replacing the tube requires a dye study and interventional radiology to ensure that the tube is back in the correct place. Because there's a higher risk of the tube clogging with homemade blends, you just wanna wait until that tract has been healed. Should the tube get clogged for any reason, you don't have to take a trip to the emergency room to have it replaced. We don't recommend blenderized, homemade blenderized feeds with a nasogastric tube, a nasojejunal tube, or a J-tube. The tube size should be a minimum of a 14 French. Most G-tubes are. I would say in general, 12 French tubes are placed really only in babies and very small babies, at least at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, but that's something that can be pretty easily upsized in the, in the surgical or GI clinic. The patient should be able to tolerate bolus feeds, though I will give you a caveat there, as many patients are able to tolerate bolus feeds of homemade blenderized feeds, while not necessarily being able to tolerate bolus feeds of a commercially available formula. They should have be able to meet their nutrition needs with a wide variety of safe foods. So depending on the number of allergies, this may make it tricky to do a complete nutrition through a homemade blend. And then the family should have adequate resources. So there should be a dietitian who's available for oversight, uh, including recipe development and patient monitoring. The family should have adequate financial and material resources. So the ability to purchase the high quality blender, having a kitchen space for safe, clean preparation and storage. And they should know, basically know what they're getting themselves in the, into. So many of these clinic visits for me are more than an hour long when we first start talking about homemade blends. As we really go through all of the available options, as Lisa already suggested, what some of those combinations were. And so that the family, should they choose to go forward with homemade blenderized feeds, knows how much time and the resources and, and such that is required to do this type of feeds for their child. So more on some of those red flags. So should the patient be less than nine months corrected, you just want to wait until they're in of over nine months corrected age. If they're medically unstable or immunocompromised, you want to wait until that situation has passed. And then if they have a number of dietary restrictions, you really just want to work closely with the patient's dietitian um, if you are not potentially their primary dietitian to be able to ensure that those dietary restrictions are able to be met within the blenderized tube feeds. If the patient does not have a G-tube, a further discussion with the medical team to, to discuss whether this is an option for you or for your patient. If the tube is less than a 14 French, having a discussion with gastroenterology or surgery about upsizing the G-tube, this is something that happens in the surgery clinic all of the time. In fact, sometimes inadvertently where the tube may be dislodged um, and then the, the, the site should start to close and uh, needs gentle dilation to get back up to the size where a 14 French tube might fit in. If they're on continuous feeds, really some thought about whether A, they might be able to tolerate bolus feeds of a blenderized formula or blenderized feeds, um, or whether you can transition to bolus feeds of a commercially available formula before the transition. If there are not enough safe foods identified, if the patient has multiple food allergies, you may be able to do a combination, say, of a hypoallergenic formula with some blenderized foods that are safe just to ensure adequate nutrition. And then if there's a problem with resources, really working with your whole team. We have a, a social worker in our surgical clinic who has been able to, for instance, offset another bill for the families that they're able to purchase the high quality blender, which are in the several hundred dollars range. Um, some of the blender companies also do have, or used to at least, have uh, programs for patients that were using it for homemade blenderized feeds, where if you had a letter of me medical necessity, for example, you may be able to get a refurbished blender for a discount. So looking into all those options. And really, if it's a family that hasn't been compliant in the past, coming up with a plan with the family about what would be expected or required to continue with this mode of nutrition support. So where can you find reliable, nutritionally, nutritionally complete recipes created by a dietitian? And that is at www.complete.com. 
this really started as a tool that was created out of a need. And I would say in the neighborhood of about 10 years ago or so, I started getting maybe a request once or twice a month for homemade blenderized feeds and really very little on commercially available products because a lot of those products that you know of now were not yet on the market. This has slowly increased over time to the point where at this point, I'm probably using commercially available blenderized feeds on a daily basis and talking about homemade blenderized feeds one to two times a week. And so as you can imagine, this as, as the increase, as the need increased and the requests increased, we really needed some sort of tool to be able to help families move forward with this. And that tool really didn't exist. And what it started out as was an Excel spreadsheet that had a lot of the food categories you're going to see moving forward and ways that the family could mix things together. But it was a very static tool. There was families that had lots of notes on the sides of it, really didn't have any help. They were primarily the only caregiver that could do it because to explain it to someone else was difficult and challenging. Um, and so it really was how could we take this Excel spreadsheet and turn it into a dynamic web-based solution that would help families and providers? We have a, an office at CHOP called the Office of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, who's really whose role is to take problems that clinicians find and the solutions that those same clinicians have found to solve that problem and turn them into a reality. So that was where I started probably in the neighborhood of five to six years ago at this point. And it was in 2020 that this tool was actually released and available online for the first time. So the first thing we did was really get some user feedback testing from both dietitians and families. There is in the neighborhood of 85 to 90 pediatric dietitians at CHOP. And we had a response rate of about 50 dietitians that were sent a survey to assess their feedback and provide any inputs on the features. We also interviewed eight patient families, including a mix of those on blenderized tube feeds and those who had no experience with blenderized feeds, though all of the respondents had, had at very least been introduced to the concept by the dietitian who was following them. One thing we asked was, what would you want this tool to do if it did exist? And the number one request by both dietitians and patient families was that it could calculate the total volume. So dietitians, us as dietitians are very used to providing recommendations for families that is a specific volume given at a specific rate at a specific time through the course of the day. And that's a lot more difficult to do with homemade blends because as you can imagine, if you blend 10 ingredients one day and 10 different ingredients the next day, you might get to very different volumes depending on what ingredients you choose and how much of the volume you need of each of those ingredients to meet a particular calorie goal. And so a lot of families were in this situation where they would make blends through this Excel spreadsheet, but not know at the end of the day what the total was going to be until they had already blended it. And now they were potentially in a situation where they had to give a higher volume than their child could tolerate in a 24-hour period. The next was a recipe builder. So some way to take, let the parents build recipes as they went along and know that if they were out of carrots, for instance, what they could substitute in place of carrots that would keep the nutritional composition of the recipe the same. And then the last was a recipe share ability with the dietitian so that they could go back and forth to say, here's what I built. Do I need to change anything? Do I need to update anything? Or just in preparation for a clinic visit to be able to share with the dietitian what they had most recently done uh, so that growth could be assessed but in a better way. Providers really needed a tool that would reduce the manual calculations and maximize their efficiency with these patients. And the idea for the blenderized tube feeding recipe builders is that will alleviate these workflows and provide a safe platform to education to educate and monitor patient families. Families, on the other hand, were looking for a tool to help relieve the stress associated with their child's condition and increase their flexibility with preparation and planning that was required for feeding. Parents ultimately, ultimately want to feel like they're providing for their child, and there is a plethora of research where blenderized feeds really enable the parents to, to feel that way, right? So when you're opening a carton of formula or even just using a G-tube, you're taking away that ability that a parent innately has to nourish their child. And this mode of feeding actually gives some of that control back to the parent, but it does this, this blenderized tube feeding recipe builder, builder does it in a way that makes it easier for them to do it in this long and what could be an arduous process. 
why did we collaborate with Nestle to make this? So the biggest reason was to be able to improve the accessibility to both healthcare providers as well as patient families. I have a network of 85 to 90 colleagues at CHOP that I can run ideas by or talk through different problems with a particular patient. But we wanted this to be accessible to the dietitian who maybe is in the Midwest at a small community hospital, but is still getting these requests from families. Or to be available for parents in a similar situation who maybe the dietitian that they're seeing doesn't have a lot of experience, but they're able to work with their healthcare provider to show this to them and really be able to move forward in the way that they want to feed their child without having to go to a large institution in a major city to find people who know how to do this. And then the other reason was that we were able to make it safe and eliminate the guesswork uh, and let it be used in a variety of different populations so that dietitians with a particular specialty were able to see what potentially the parents were doing and be able to tweak it for them to meet any, any dietary restrictions that they may have related to their condition. How does it work? So very easy. The first thing you do is create a profile. All you need is an email and password. You're then able to choose dietary restrictions, um, including milk-free, egg-free, soy-free, vegetarian, and nut-free. You select the number of calories that you or your patient or your child needs each day, anywhere from 800 to 2,000 calories in 200 calorie increments. And then you are able to put in a volume limit if you need to do, if you need to do so. And when I show you the example, we're going to do one without a volume limit and one with a volume limit. So you'll be able to see how it's different if you do fill in that particular box. You're then taken through a variety of ingredient categories where you build a recipe. And then finally, you save the recipe. And as you can see in the screen, you'll see it bigger in a few moments. On the left-hand side, you get the recipe itself. And on the right-hand side, a recipe summary that includes total calories, macronutrient dis distribution, and then grams of carbohydrate, protein, fat, and fiber, as well as the total volume, the number one requested feature of the recipe builder. There's eight food categories included within the recipe builder, including nutrient-rich base. So things like whole milk, almond milk, soy milk, yogurts of a variety of different protein sources, protein-rich foods such as beans, turkey, tofu, eggs, fish, chicken, and beef, vitamin A-rich fruits and vegetables like squash, carrots, and sweet potatoes, vitamin C-rich fruits and vegetables like strawberries, mango, spinach, pineapple, orange juice, additional fruits and vegetables to really just those whose predominant nutrient source is not vitamin A, vitamin C, or potassium. And that includes things like watermelon, broccoli, melons, pears, blueberries, apples, zucchini, potassium rich foods like bananas, potato and blackstrap molasses, a very low volume ingredient that is a rich source of potassium for those who are volume sensitive. Grains such as pasta, rice, oatmeal, bread, and quinoa. And lastly, fats such as peanut butter, avocados, oils, and nuts. The features include the ability to create nutritionally complete recipes from scratch with no use of formula whatsoever. To be able to customize to each patient's unique needs, including calories, volume limitations, and allergies. There are hundreds of ingredient combinations, so you literally could make a different recipe every day of the month if you so chose. It does calculate the total volume of the recipe so that you'll know what you're working with before you blend it and are able to know if that will fit within your child, your patients, or your own volume restrictions. Ability to save recipes and meal plan for up to seven days in a row. It generates a shopping list from the meal plans so that you know what you're needing to buy when you go to the grocery store or submit your Instacart order, however you're shopping nowadays. And then it does generate a PDF of any recipe that you want to share with your healthcare team. So we're going to go through and do a little demonstration of this now. So as I said, you'll go to www.complete.com and be able to sign in once you've created a profile. All you need to sign in is your username or your email and your password. 
After signing in, you'll click on Blended Home, which is in the upper middle right section of the web page, and at first be taken to build your profile. You'll be able to select any dietary restrictions, milk-free, nut-free, vegetarian, soy-free, and egg-free, or leave them all blank. You'll next select your calorie total. In this case, we're going to start with 1,000 calories. And then here you'll be able to put in a volume restriction if you so chose. In this case, we're going to leave it out for this first example. Lastly, you'll just select who you're creating the recipes for. Once clicking on the next step, you'll be taken into the option to either blend from scratch, which is what we're going to do here. These are using recipes that do not contain any formula at all. After clicking on blend from scratch, you'll be taken into the recipe builder itself and through the eight different ingredient categories. You'll see the number of servings below each of the titles. So for this thousand calorie recipe, we need two servings of the nutrient rich base. And we're going to go with one cup of whole milk as well as one serving of the whole milk yogurt. Once you've selected the number of ingredients, it will turn green below the different uh, description and enable you to click on to the next step. You will not be able to click on to the next step until you have selected the number of ingredients from that section. Next is the protein rich foods. We need one serving from here in the thousand calorie recipe and we're going to go with chicken in this case. On to the next ingredient which is vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. And we need one serving from this particular category. We're going to go ahead and in this case, go with uh, sweet potatoes, one serving of sweet potatoes. After selecting here, we'll go on to the next step, which is the vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables. We need two servings from here and we're going to go with strawberries as well as pineapple. In the next category is vitamin, excuse me, additional fruits and vegetables. And we're gonna go with two servings from here. We're gonna do one serving of watermelon and one serving of broccoli. The next category is potassium rich fruits and vegetables. And we need one serving from here. We're gonna go with one serving of a baked potato. The next category is grains. And we need one and a half servings from here. And we're gonna go ahead and go with the pasta and a half a serving of the quinoa. And then the last category is fats. And in this first example, we need two servings from here and we're gonna go with one serving of oil as well as one serving of the avocado. Once you've selected from all the ingredients, you'll have to give your recipe a name. I would suggest, especially if you're a provider using this for patients, something that illustrates what category you're in, including restrictions and calorie level, as you can change the profile under your same account. So this will let you know where you are. After you name the recipe, you'll be taken to the recipe summary page. So on the left-hand side, you have the ingredient list. The measurement to the left of the ingredient is the amount you'll measure for the recipe. The amount to the right, the number in parentheses, is the volume it makes when blended. And you'll see why that's important in our second example when we put in a volume limit. On the right-hand side, you see a summary of the recipe, including the total calories, grams of protein, carbohydrate, fats, fiber, and the macronutrient distribution, as well as the total volume. On the bottom, you'll see the amount of supplements that needed to be added. This recipe builder is intended for to meet the nutrition needs of children ages 1 to 13 years of age, and so that's what those supplements are doing is meeting the DRI for that particular age category. If you are above 13, you want to just speak with your dietitian about what other changes you may need to make. When you click on save as a PDF, you'll be able to add any notes to the recipe that you'd like to include. In this case, we're saying for the babysitter who might be making it for us. And then once you click on the print screen, you're able to either save it as a PDF or print it out, whatever the case may be, um, to whatever printer you need. And then that will either print it or save it for you to email it to the babysitter, to your healthcare provider, whatever the case may be. We're now going to go back into our account and we're going to change our profile, uh, which you are able to do as a patient or as a provider. So if you're doing it for two different patients, two different children, or using it as a provider for multiple, multiple patients. And it's, in the second example, we're going to select milk-free and egg-free from the dietary restrictions. We're going to change our calorie total to 1,200, and then we're going to put in a volume restriction of 1200 milliliters per day. 
after you save the profile, you'll again be able to start by clicking on blend from scratch, which will take you into the recipe builder itself. You're gonna be taken through the same eight categories that we went through the first time. So first being nutrient rich base. And as you can see, all the milk containing ingredients are no longer options. So we need two and a half servings from here. We're gonna go with one serving of the almond milk and one and a half servings of the coconut yogurt. The next category is protein rich foods. And as you can see, egg has been removed from the category, from the ingredient list. We need two servings from here and we're gonna go with one serving of beans and one serving of ground turkey. Our next category is vitamin A rich foods. And we're gonna go ahead and go with one serving of carrots. In the vitamin C rich fruits and vegetables, we need two servings from here. We're gonna go with one serving of the orange juice and one serving of the spinach. The next category is the additional fruits and vegetables. We need two servings from here. We're gonna go with one serving of blueberries, one serving of raspberries. Next is the potassium rich fruits and vegetables. And we're gonna go ahead and go with one serving of banana. Next is gonna be the grains category. And we're gonna start here by picking oatmeal and bread. Um, and I'm gonna point out to you again that the volume in parentheses behind the ingredient list is the volume when blended. That's gonna become important in a moment. And then our last category is fats. We need two servings from here and we're going to go with almonds as well as one serving of the peanut butter. After we name the recipe, whatever is floating your fancy on that day, um, but again, something that lets you know what actually it is, especially if you change the profile, will be taken to the, the summary page that you've seen before. And what I want to point out to you is this volume limit here of 1,200 milliliters. And what you can see is the recipe is 60 milliliters above the volume limit that we placed. So it's 1,260 milliliters instead of 1,200. At this point, you're able to edit any of the ingredients. And we're going to go ahead and edit the grain section because this oatmeal, when blended, makes 200 milliliters worth of volume. So we're going to instead take out the oatmeal and go ahead and select the white rice instead, which is going to lower the volume by 75 milliliters. Once we go ahead and save that, you'll see now that your total volume has dropped from 1260 milliliters to 1185 milliliters per day. So it's underneath the volume limit of 1200 that you placed in the um, profile builder before we began. The next uh, thing we're gonna show you is the meal planning. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the meal plans tab. And you're gonna first, uh, click on create a new meal plan. Here you'd see any that you had already created and saved, but we're going to start from scratch. The first thing we'll have to select is the number of days that we're meal planning for. In this case, we're going to go ahead and go for four days to start with. So you can select anywhere from one day up to seven. Once you've done that, you pick the start date for your meal plan. In this case, we're going to go with January 28th. And then the next step is uh, to select the recipes. So what will show up here is any recipes that are saved within your profile. So this is where I say if you're using it for multiple patients, multiple uh, children, or uh, multiple people within your household, you'll just want to have some name that lets you know which ones have which uh, calorie builder and profile, et cetera, in them when you're selecting. In this case, we're going to just mix and match so that we can show you what the total is. And we're gonna do two days of the first recipe we built and then two days of the second recipe that we built. Once you've selected all the recipes, you'll click on next step and give that meal plan a name, just as you did for your recipes themselves. In this case, we're gonna call it vacation weekend. And then when you submit, you'll go to the meal plan landing page or summary page which is on the left-hand side, going to consist of a little recipe card of all of the individual recipes with the corresponding day um, that you selected. 
I will have each of the ingredients printed out in a little, little recipe card with the volumes that you need to measure, including any supplements that needed to be added, again, for ages one to 13. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see a shopping list. And that shopping list is essentially going to be all the ingredients added together that you're able to send to yourself as a PDF, print out, whatever the case may be, so that if you're sending to someone in advance or even just meal planning for yourself for the week, you'll know everything that you need to purchase from the grocery store to make these four recipes. As I mentioned, this was another one of the features that was requested by the families um, to know that if you're at the grocery store, how many bags of carrots are going to get you through how many recipes on any given day. And so this tabulates that for you so that you can see it all before you go. Once you click, uh, click on save as a PDF, you'll be able to enter any notes here um, for whoever you may be sending it to, whether it's your healthcare provider, whether it's yourself, whether it's a grandparent, a spouse, whomever. And then when you hit print, you will be able to either print it or save it as a PDF that you can then email to uh, any other caregiver or family member. And what you'll see is the shopping list, print it all out there for you. And then once again, all of the different recipes for each of the days that were selected on any given number of days. You'll then can go back to your account, which does have on the left-hand side, the recipe building tool, your recipe summary page, your meal plans, and your ability to go ahead and build recipes through your recipe book. Okay, right. so back to the presentation here. So now you've tried it out, or you can see how you how it will work if you were to go forward. So what equipment do you need to get started? So first, as I mentioned, a minimum of a 14 French G2. You're gonna need the bolus extension sets, which are in the G-Tube kit itself and can all but also be ordered separately from home care. Um, I have had patients use the right angle extension sets that come in the kits and those generally work pretty fine as well. The bolus extension sets are a little bit wider diameter, so a little bit easier to push, push the blends through. You're gonna need a high quality blender, so something that completely liquefies food so that you're able to push it through the extension set and through the G-Tube. 60C catheter tip syringes to be able to push it through, and then non-porous containers for storage. So starting, what recipe do you provide? So the first is to remember to check for any food allergies or intolerances the patient may have. Allergen-friendly versions are available for milk-free, egg-free, soy-free, peanut and tree nut-free, as well as vegetarian. Calorie needs are generally about 10 to 20% higher with blenderized feeds than with commercially available formula. And the reason for that is that a couple, a couple things. So first, if I measure a cup and you measure a cup and Lisa measures a cup, we're all going to get a slightly different volume of what we measure. So this allows for a little bit of error there. The other is that unlike commercially available products, which are deemed as medical foods, Meaning that if the label says one calorie is one milliliter of formula, that one milliliter is going to be one calorie. Food labels are able to actually be a little bit off in their value um, by upwards of 5%, depending on the total calories that are in the product itself. So this just enables that a little bit of error that's sort of inherent in both the measurements and the products that we use or the information we have to make the recipes to account for some of that. If you're a provider, take time to become familiar with the content. So when I do this with families in the clinic, we actually open up the recipe builder together and we go through how it works so they can see actually what they're gonna be selecting from. I can explain what all the numbers in there are and what they're seeing at the end, including the supplements that may need to be added to the product. How do you introduce the blenderized diet? So there's no right or wrong answer to this, but it should be based on clinical judgment and on your knowledge of the patient. So some options include, let's say for instance, that the patient currently is receiving four bolus feeds and eight hours of overnight feeds with a commercially available product. You can make a recipe, split it over two days and replace the four bolus feeds with the equivalent volume of the homemade blenderized feed while continuing the overnight feed. You could give this for one to two weeks and then eventually transition the overnight feeds into bolus feeds so that 100% of the blenderized tube feeding recipe is given within 24 hours. 
you could give 25% of the recipe for four days. Then, so in the exa above example, replace two of the bolus feeds um, for four days in a row, and then 50% for two days. So replace all four of the bolus feeds for two days, and then eventually transition to 100% of the blends in all bolus feeds at day seven and beyond. You could introduce one ingredient at a time with one new ingredient in new ingredient every three days. This is a really good example for parents to want to start when their children are under 12 months of old age. So I've been able to give the parents a list of all the ingredients that are in the recipe builder. And they've been able to slowly introduce those ingredients to their child in combination with breast milk or infant formula until they've got all of them introduced or enough at least to make a recipe and the child is then 12 months old. It's another very good option for a patient, say, who might be five or six years of age and only ever received a, a hypoallergenic formula. So you don't actually know if they're going to be intolerant to some of the ingredients that are in the recipe builder. I've done that where the, I've done that and we've made a blend and then the patient does have a reaction of some kind and we have to sort of backtrack to figure out what was it that was in there that didn't. So this would alleviate that particular issue. Or you can just go for it. So if the patient especially is already on a commercially available whole food product, this really is a pretty easy switch on a one-to-one -one basis. So it doesn't have to take, it doesn't have to be transitioned to depending on, again, what the clinical context is of the patient. How do you give it? So one example is the same bolus volume the patient is currently receiving. So if they're tolerating 150 milliliters of formula, commercially available formula, the odds are pretty high that they'll be able to tolerate at least 150 milliliters of commercially available, or excuse me, of a homemade blenderized feed. I come from the world of surgery, so we talk in milliliters per kilo. Um, gastric volume is about 20 to 22 milliliters per kilo, regardless of your age. So the younger, younger you are obviously the smaller volume you're going to be able to tolerate. 15 milliliters per kilo comes from any patient who has had surgery, a surgical treatment for reflux, a fundoplication of some kind. Gastric volume goes down by about a third in that scenario when you're talking about giving two feeds as opposed to the patient eating orally. And so somewhere between 15 to 20 milliliters per kilo is a safe volume. Let's say if the patient's on continuous feeds, to start with that is likely to be well tolerated. And then what I would recommend is increasing the volume as tolerated. Most kids will tolerate a higher volume of a blenderized formula than a commercial formula, with most patients being able to receive 100% of the recipe in four to six feeds per day and eliminate the need for anything given overnight. You want to bring the recipe to room temperature prior to delivery. This has less to do with gastric tolerance and more to just do with your ability to be able to push it through the syringe. So any of you who, who cook at home and know that when you store leftovers in the fridge, they tend to get thicker when they're cold than when they're warm or they're room temperature. So this just enables you to more easily provide the feed to the patient. You'll use a 60 milliliter syringe, push, pushing your prescribed bolus volume over about 15 to 45 minutes. This does not necessarily mean 15 or 45 minutes of continuous slow pushing. What this might mean if the bolus volume is 180 milliliters is to give 60 mLs pushed over two to three minutes, wait 10 or 15 minutes, push another 60 mLs, wait 10 or 15 minutes, push the final 60 cc's so that the whole volume takes about 30 to 45 minutes when all is said and done. Keep in mind that it can be out of the refrigerator really only for a maximum of two hours, which comes from just basic food safety guidelines, which brings us to the first point of our next question is talking about storage. So you wanna follow basic food safety guidelines when making these recipes. So that includes cooking meats to the temperature recommended. It includes using separate cutting boards for raw meats versus cooked meats and produce, washing the tops of cans, washing all fruits and vegetables, et cetera. So things that you're really just doing on a daily basis when you're cooking for your family. If the blend is made fresh, you wanna refrigerate it and use it within four days. If it's made fresh and not going to be used within four days, you wanna store in non-porous containers and immediately place it into the freezer. Keep in mind what type of packaging that you're using and when you will need to use the blend as you do wanna thaw it in the refrigerator. So if it's in a, in a relatively 
um, long skinny or excuse me, a tall skinny container that might take longer to thaw than something that's in a wider container. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're choosing what to, to freeze and then when you need to take it out of the freezer to get it completely thawed out in the fridge. As, a, as I mentioned already, you don't want to keep it out of the refrigerator for more than two hours, which are, again, just basic food safety guidelines for anything. Uh, and then batch cooking is not only acceptable, but it may actually be easier for the family. How can you save money? So first, buying food in bulk. So any of those of you who have Costco or BJ's or Sam's Club memberships know that if you have the storage base, it is cheaper sometimes to say buy rice or frozen fruits and vegetables uh, for smoothies or whatever you're making at home currently than it is to buy them at the grocery store in smaller packaging. Using frozen canned or jarred vegetables is another great way to save money. There is no nutritional difference between frozen canned and jarred vegetables. Frozen vegetables are in fact just flash cooked and then frozen. So they're almost the same as a fresh vegetable except they're significantly cheaper uh, and able to have a longer shelf life because they're good in the freezer for months as opposed to produce that you may buy fresh that really has a shelf life of you know, upwards of seven days at the most typically. I have one mom who always uses pineapple in the recipe. She finds that that helps with constipation for her child. And during the winter months and spring and fall, she'll buy the giant frozen bag of pineapple from BJ's that she's able to store in her fridge and just pull out as needed versus using fresh when it's more readily available at a cheaper price in the grocery store. Using refillable pouches for storage and easy travel is another way to save some money um, as these are pretty readily available, especially for uh, parents that are making their own baby food. So they have all sorts of containers for storing baby food blends or homemade baby foods that really could be used also for patients using homemade blenderized feeds. As I mentioned, batch cooking. So when we when we did the interviews and then through my own clinical experience, we found that parents do this in all kinds of different ways. I have one mom who every evening she takes whatever the family had for dinner, she uses that, and then she adds all the foods around it to make the blend for the next day. I have another mom who tends to get all her ingredients, cook on a Sunday, and she will make a week worth of meals in a couple of hours, some of which she keeps in the fridge, some of which she puts in the freezer. And yet another parent that we interviewed actually makes 30 days worth of meals at once. On a Sunday, she takes a few hours um, and is able to do that for the entire month. You can also use a slow cooker to cook meats, grains, legumes, etc. Meaning you can also actually batch cook personal ingredients. So let's say you're throwing in a chicken, in this case on a Sunday when you're just home, and you're able to blend up that chicken in the portions that you need for the recipe for the week. So maybe you didn't do all of the ingredients, but you did some, some that maybe have a higher cooking time or take a little bit more time to prepare that you can just pull out of the fridge or freezer to go forward. And then get a, getting creative with freezing. So muffin tins, ice cube trays, freezer bags, all sorts of ways to freeze things, um, potentially depending on what freezer size you have, what, what type of freezer, whether it's an upright freezer versus a chest freezer, um, to be able to make things ahead of time and freeze them to have them on hand. Some additional tips and tricks, you can use a coffee grinder to crush any vitamins, grind nuts, seeds, et cetera, before you throw them in the blender. Keep the skin on fruits uh, for added fiber. Whole foods typically blend easier when warm. So if a food is intended to be eaten warm, it typically is easier to blend that way. So if you batch cooked, for instance, the chicken for the week, pop it in the microwave, you know, for a minute or so to get it up to a warmer temperature before you throw it in the blender as it will typically blend easier. And then for added nutrients, you can use the water from cooked vegetables to thin the blends if needed. I would, I would tell you to exercise caution here because you're going to know the volume potentially that it makes ahead of time. But with all of these recipes, in order to get the calorie total you're aiming for, you need to give 100% of the recipe within 24 hours. So most parents will find it easier to just give the blends the way they're blending and then add water separately so that they're not trying to give larger volumes um, through the course of the day. And typically water is so well tolerated and easily tolerated that it's a pretty simple thing to give uh, in through the course of the day. So some troubleshooting, what's the backup plan? So we recommend that all of our patients have a plan that includes some sort of commercially available formula on hand. And the reason for that, and these are all examples from real life that I'm gonna give you, is let's say that there's a hurricane and the power goes out and is out for two weeks and you have no way to use your blender or use the fridge or the freezer. 
Let's say that you're driving cross country with two children under the age of five for a wedding in Colorado that your children are in by yourself. And you have to do that in the course of four days and really can't have, a, don't have the ability to store and blend on the road. Let's say that you wake up with a GI virus on the day that you're intended to make these blends um, and you have nothing in the freezer. So I've had one mom equate this to, in her case, when her kids are really busy with seven different activities and everyone's going in a direction, different direction and they order pizza for dinner or they throw in chicken nuggets from the freezer. So similar sort of thing where you have a way to feed your tube fed child or your tube fed patients um, that doesn't involve the homemade blends just in case. Most of this is able to be covered by insurance and you're able to get say a case or two a month, whatever you'd like to have on, on hand that you can just store in your pantry, in your basement, you know, wherever the case may be, that's there in case of an emergency. What if the caregivers prefer to give meals rather than one large batch of formula? Totally fine. You can actually still use the recipe builder in this case and just make sure that you've gone through each of the ingredients. So for instance, you could give whole milk, oatmeal, and strawberries for breakfast. You could give a banana and peanut butter as a snack. You could give turkey and sweet potatoes and broccoli and bread for lunch, etc. Just making sure that you've checked off all of the ingredients that are in the recipe in the course of 24 hours. And then for the providers in the audience, so how do you work with a caregiver when they've already started to make a blend, but you can tell that it's not nutritionally appropriate? And I think that you have two different paths here. You have one group of caregivers who wants any help that they can possibly get, but have not been able to find that from care from providers that they've seen. And in this case, they're gonna be open to any suggestion that you have to offer. And so showing them the recipe builder or whatever tips and tricks that you might have gathered along the way, you're able to get this, uh, help them get continue on their journey in maybe a more nutritionally complete way. If it's a caregiver maybe who was recommended to go see you from another healthcare provider who's really a little hesitant and feels like they're doing everything right and they don't need any assistance, what I would say is pick the thing that scares you the most and fix that. So for instance, if you go through the whole recipe and there's no source of fat, have them talk to them about adding avocado or nuts or oil to the blend. If there's no sodium in the in the recipe, talk to them about adding a quarter teaspoon or a half a teaspoon of salt every day, explaining why those ingredients are, are important. And then that really helps you to build a rapport with the family to hopefully help them be open to any suggestions moving forward should they be needed. So in conclusion, blenderized diets are well tolerated, safe, and a relatively low cost intervention to improve health outcomes in the pediatric population with the potential for significant reductions in healthcare costs. Blenderized diets can be used in numerous populations, including those with difficulty tolerating conventional formulas, those with a variety of medical conditions, and even those with major food allergies. Equip yourselves as dietitians to manage patients receiving blenderized tube feeds. The trend is continuing to grow and I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. So this is gonna to continue to show up um, through requests from parents or patients. And then reliably nutritionally complete recipes created by a dietitian for children ages one to 13 years can be found at www.complete.com. And that brings me to the end of my presentation and time for it to be Lauren's turn. Thanks so much, Robin. That was so much information. <laughs> um, a lot of great feedback from people as they listened. Uh, our final speaker today is Lauren Exigian. And Lauren is the mom to James, an eight-year-old boy who was diagnosed at the age of two with a rare genetic disorder called floating harbor syndrome. Lauren is a nurse practitioner in general surgery at CHOP and works with Robin, and I'm going to let her take it from there. Hi, everybody. I'm really honored to be here today and share um, my story and James's story, essentially. Um, so like Lisa said, James is an eight-year-old, soon to be nine this summer. Um, when he was born, he was small, um, had IUGR or intrauterine growth restriction, you know, that we didn't discover until my 37th week. He was only four pounds, 11 ounces when he was born. We worked with a um, gastroenterologist in the beginning to try to figure out causes for this. It was felt 
you know, that his poor growth and weight gain was just related to really severe reflux. Um, and so we initially were on just a standard pediatric formula, doing, you know, high calorie formula, reflux medication. Um, when he turned one, we started doing NG tube feeds with the same feeding regimen that he was doing by mouth because we noticed that he was struggling a bit with his oral skills. Um, it wasn't until he turned two, actually, on his second birthday, he had a seizure. And two days later, had two more seizures. And so it prompted us to go to CHOP, where I am also a nurse practitioner. And we did more of an extensive workup for him there, thinking that maybe the seizures and the feeding issues could be related, which in fact it was. Um, so James was discovered to have this rare genetic syndrome called floating harbor syndrome, which affects his overall development, but significantly affects um, his ability eating and his speech and language skills. And then we also discovered, um, much to a surprise, that he has a metabolic syndrome that was not flagged on newborn screen, um, which come to learn after the specialist at CHOP spoke with the CDC. James, at that time, was the first child that they had ever known to have a normal newborn screen and have a late onset metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> so with this syndrome, he lacks arginine in the urea cycle to break down protein. So he essentially needs a protein restricted diet, almost like a vegetarian, but he's allowed some protein throughout the day. So we continue to work with our dietitians through metabolism, you know, with this restricted diet. And in all honesty, we were still struggling. We were feeding him, you know, we'd gotten a G tube at the age of three and we were feeding him this um, metabolic component uh, formula, it was the essential amino acid formula, mixed in with another kind of standard pediatric formula. Um, and we really struggled. It was very difficult, not just for weight gain and growth, but to get him to tolerate the feeds. Um, he would get feeds during the day and feeds at night and he had a lot of retching, a lot of vomiting. It, it seemed like his reflux um, was still pretty severe and, and we really couldn't wrap our minds around it. You know, and being a medical provider, I found that my husband, who is non-medical, is looking to me to say, why is this happening? What's going on? Why isn't it better? And I really had no, you know, no idea. Nobody really did. Um, so it wasn't until about in 2020 during the pandemic, um, when I was at work, had a conversation with Robin. You know, she had called in to talk about patients. We finished that conversation. And she said to me, how is James? And for whatever reason, I kind of just went into it and said, we're just really struggling. And it's, and for us, the biggest issue was getting that volume in. And so Robin had asked, you know, well, what's your goal? You know, what, what, what specifically are you struggling with? And that, that was honestly the first time that someone has specifically said, like, what is your goal? What do you want for your child? From the very beginning with James and all of his diagnoses, we've always wanted him to have a quote unquote normal life. We've always said he's going to do everything else, every other child, every other individual gets to do. It may just be in a different way, or we may have to do it in a specialized way, but he's going to do it. And so we've tried to have this mindset with everything. And so when she said, what's your goal? My first thing was, is we wanted to get him off the overnight feeds and be able to eat more during the day, like everyone else does, right? You don't usually eat in the middle of the night, unless you're a night shift worker. Um, and, you know, our struggle was getting the volume in. It seems like with these formulas, it was such a large volume to get into him. And it seemed like he just couldn't tolerate it. So Robin had said, did you consider the blenderized diet? And I've had patients on it. And even being immersed in that world, it wasn't something that I even considered for my own child until she actually said it. Um, we had a like 45 minute conversation about it. I went right on the website. I registered, I contacted my metabolic dietitian who we've been working with for years and said, this is what I'm interested in. This is what I would like to do. Can you help me? It was very simple. She gave me all of the information for the profile about, you know, volume restrictions, what diet restrictions we had to put in. I plugged it in went right through like Robin showed you on the example. And the best part was, is that in that recipe builder, like Robin showed you, it'll tell you each food item, but it also tells you in parentheses next to it, how many MLs. And so again, for us, when we're trying to be volume conscious, 
it helped me be able to pick things better knowing that it would create less volume, but still be nutritionally sound for James, which obviously was the most important part. So I, you know, got very excited, made a bunch of recipes, sent them, saved them as a PDF. I save all of them to my computer, sent it right to my dietitian in metabolism and said, these are the recipes I made. Tell me if there's any changes I need to make. And they messaged me right back and said, either remove this or add this. And for the most part with James, it's just removing certain things if the protein content is too high. And, you know, that was it. And I decided, you know, to do kind of batch cooking with this. So I'll get whichever recipes I feel like making. I like to write out my list or I'll use the um, grocery list on the website itself. And I print that out. I take a look at what I already have go and get everything. And I just spend maybe a couple hours um, blending everything down. And I have usually about a month's worth. If I take a day grocery shop, come back and spend about maybe three or four hours at the most, I can have at least a month's worth of supply that I freeze. Um, Roz, if you can share my slides for me, if you can go to the second one. So you can see the picture on the left is kind of what a sample of James's feed looks like before it's blended. Um, and then to the right is obviously when it's blended. Um, we actually didn't have a high quality blender. Some of our family members knew that we needed this. And as a gift for, I think it was one of our birthdays, um, they kind of all chipped in and got us one. So um, just a suggestion, you know, I know not every family financially can afford these and I, they may not have family members that can provide them with one, but it's just a suggestion if, you know, instead of splurging on a holiday gift, maybe this could be something um, that people could gift others if they know that this is a diet that they want to do. And so I think um, initially when I got started, I was a little bit overwhelmed thinking of all these foods I have to buy and I have to go through all these recipes. But um, my husband honestly put it perfectly. You know, he said any kind of diet change or any kind of anything that you're going to implement in your life that's new always seems hard, right? Until it becomes routine. Once it's routine and it's something you do every day or you do frequently, it's not as hard. It seems really simple. And then somebody else comes in and you're explaining it to them. And then you're like, why don't you get this? This is so easy because it's just normal to you now. This is exactly how this blenderized diet was for us. It seemed like a lot at first, but once I did it the first time, I realized it's not really that difficult to do. And it felt so good to be able to give James real food. It felt so nice to know that the foods that I prepared for my other children at home, for myself, for my husband, were things that I were putting in to his food. And, you know, I've never been somebody who loves cooking, but ever since I had kids, I really love to make meals, serve them these meals and like see them enjoying that food. And same thing with James. I mean, I really, I didn't want to give him something that didn't make him feel well. I wanted to feed him things that he felt good with and was happy and, and enjoyed. Um, and so I felt like this really made me feel more empowered in the care that I'm giving him and the way that I'm feeding him. It was such a relief to know that I am feeding him well. And I noticed a difference in him. I noticed that, you know, he seems happier. He seems more comfortable. His reflux is definitely so much better. His feeding tolerance is better. Um, I, you know, his bowels have, you know, been much better. We haven't really needed to kind of balance out any supplements and helping his bowel regimen. Um, just like, you know, Robin had talked about before and, and Lisa that there's, you know, lots of benefits to the side of eating real food. Um, and so now it's, it is part of our routine. You know, I'll, I'll blend and I freeze. I'll either use, um, Roz, if you can go to the next slide, I'll either use, so this is a picture. I have some of the reusable food pouches, um, bought them on Amazon, pretty inexpensive. They wash up really easily. Um, wash them with soap and water, sit them out, let them air dry before I use them again. There's different sizes that they sell also. So I'll blend and I'll either fill these pouches and freeze them or I'll fill Ziploc bags. And then usually what I do on the Ziploc bag is I'll write the name of the blend, whatever name I named the recipe, I'll write on the bag just so I know which one it is. And then I put the date just so I know when I blended it. Um, 
one thing I found with the Ziploc bags is that I was worried that once they froze that they would stick together. So I took parchment paper and I just cut small squares and would lay a Ziploc bag, do a layer of parchment paper and then another Ziploc bag and just kind of stack them on top of each other. And I had no problems. Um, just like my other kids with getting ready for school and activities or whatnot, you know, I pre prepare the night before, I get lunches ready, um, kind of get things made, pulled out, set up, bags packed. So I'll take James's blend out just as if I'm preparing his lunch for the day tomorrow. I'll pull his blend out out of the freezer. I put it right into the refrigerator. So by the morning it's thawed out and I have travel containers that I use um, that are thermal. So he has a nurse that goes with him to school and I put everything into his um, thermal container. I have all his supplies available. And then that way, when he goes to school, the nurse has everything right there. It's all blended. It's all ready to go. It's thawed out. Um, so that way she can just draw it up and give it um, like we do at home for his normal schedule. Um, you know, it's been really, I feel liberating to feed him this way. Again, it's, it's foods that I'm already buying um, and I'm preparing anyway for my other children. And now I can give it to James also. And I think for us, it also makes me feel a little bit more complete knowing that he is able to kind of eat the way that we are eating because he'll sit at the table to get his feeds. And as we're eating the food, I'll say, James, you're getting, you know, carrots and spinach and broccoli, and that's what your sister's eating. So I'm trying to kind of tie in all of these things at the same time so that he knows oh, I am eating, you know, he's nonverbal. So he can't really, you know, communicate with me whether he understands or not. But normally when I say that he, he looks around at the plates and he usually kind of looks at me and smiles, you know. Um, I have found that for my husband, again, who is non-medical, this has been very easy for him also. He enjoys it. He likes being able to feed James this way also and feels the same as I do. You, you feel really good preparing real food and giving it to your child in this way. And to echo what Robin had said, we also have a commercially blended diet as a backup for the days where, hey, I know tomorrow is gonna be a crazy day between work and school and activities. I'm not gonna have time to blend today. I'm gonna use this instead. It's a great backup to have and you still feel just as good about giving it to him as you do your own blends. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, having to have to use a G-tube, you know, of course you would like your child to eat by mouth, at least, you know, that's how I feel. Um, but again, I, like I said, we've always wanted James to do everything everybody else is doing. And I know that he's not able to eat by mouth at this moment and eventually he will. So this is our way of nutritionally feeding him the same things everybody else is eating, making sure he's getting all of his vitamins, all of his nutrients, all of his hydration without having to worry about any side effects or him having worsened reflux or vomiting. Um, and through this, I was volume wise able to get everything in during the day and I was able to stop the overnight feeds. And that has been a huge game changer for his sleeping, you know, for his overall well being. His school performance has improved significantly. Um, I just can't say enough great things about this blenderized diet. The recipe builder is so easy, so user friendly you know, to all the clinicians out there, I really recommend any families that you have that are doing tube feeds, really asking them, you know, what is your goal for your child? What would you like to see happen? What, what about your feeding regimen do you like, do you not like? Some, so these questions seem so simple, but sometimes I think it's hard when you're on the other side to say, I don't like this because you don't want to make the person that you're working with feel like you're, you're unappreciative of all their efforts. But I think asking those specific things really helps parents decide what they want for their child for their feedings and, and how to get there. And I think it helps you help them to get there better. Thanks, Lauren, that was terrific. Thanks. That's, uh, so, so much to think of and um, appreciate all that that you've shared. If we could have uh, Robin and Lisa come back We've, we don't have much time for questions, um, 
but I think if we focused on just a couple of topics, maybe we'll get through um, kind of a, a chunk of them. Um, one, there were a lot of questions about um, reimbursement and blenderized tube feeding. And uh, Lisa, I think maybe, can you address that a bit? Yeah, so obviously with reimbursement, I am not an expert. I want to have a caveat that, you know, everybody's insurance plans are going to be different, but there are some general things um, to keep in mind. So the first thing would be is for Medicare patients, if they are home blending, they are likely not going to have coverage for supplies because if they don't order commercial formula, Medicare will not pay for supplies. So that's a conversation to have. When it comes to the commercial blenderized formulas, reimbursement for those, um, I'm just honest and say every insurance is different and I you're going to have to check with your insurance, but definitely what I don't want to do is make an assumption that a family is not willing to pay for a commercial product just because their insurance doesn't pay for it. So I think that's sometimes a mistake that healthcare providers make of, oh, this isn't covered by insurance, so I'm not going to recommend it. Um, I think if you're forthcoming and say, I don't know if this is going to be covered by insurance or if they're asking you, I want to use this commercial blenderized product, that would be part of the conversation and, and letting them make the decision themselves versus myself. Another thing that I think has changed since the Medicare guidelines um, kind of got a little less stringent in November of last year was we can paint that picture much better in the medical record of why we might be using a non-standard commercial formula, where in the past we had to have a failed trial. Um, and so I always say, paint the picture in your notes of why you're recommending a certain product. And all you can do is be truthful and, and do your due diligence at documenting and really just having that open and honest conversation is these types of things may affect reimbursement of your supplies or I don't know if it's going to be covered um, but at least you're then not withholding information because you're assuming that they don't want to pay out of pocket for something. Can I add, I'm going to add something to Lisa so that you can also there's a little bit of I find the insurance companies to be a particular challenge that you know you're going to tell me no, but no, you're not going to tell me no, because we're going to prove to you why that's not the case. Um, and we actually were able to get uh, care centrics in New Jersey. I'm just going to say the name, but it was in New Jersey to actually reverse their policy on a blanket statement of not covering homemade blenderized tube feeds by uh, I partnered with one of our surgery attendings and actually went and talked to their medical director and were able to provide research in particular patient populations that reversed that particular uh, line within the insurance. So there's a ways around it, but it's, it's, it's effort on the part of your medical team um, to really sort of take that on. Um, but they, it's, it's, I view it as a challenge. Um, so, so, you know, but it's not necessarily a note. A no does not mean a no is what I want to say, I think, and to sum that up. Thanks. Um, the other one that seems to have showed up quite a bit was whether there's a tool similar to this tool to recipe builder for adults. Oh, that's coming. <laughs> so, that's great. That's so great so we're working, we're working on that. Um, um, we're, we're working on having those conversations with Nestle right now, actually. Um, so for, and I will be the one building it. So it would be something similar uh, and would be for ages 13 and above. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> probably not at this point, probably not for at least another uh, 12 to 18 months, but it is hopefully coming. That's terrific. And then the third one that seemed to be a common theme was about uh, French size, how, you know, what to do if you have a 12, cent, 12 French tube or, and also J tubes. Yeah, so um, I'll offer my opinion and then Lisa can certainly share hers. So, so tube sizes, especially G tubes, and actually Lauren can even speak to this as a nurse practitioner, they're very easy to upsize. So uh, for the most part, I think the only kids for us that are getting 12 French tubers are some of the really small babies. Uh, and so they might've had them when they were an infant and it just never got upsized, but it's not to say that it can't be upsized. Uh, for J tubes, 
we don't re recommend homemade blends for a couple reasons. One is that you need to do feed on a pump through a J-tube. You need continuous feeds. You can't get bolus feeds through the jejunum. Um, so that's one reason. The second reason is that the French size in some of the J-tubes is different. Uh, though the, uh, I'm gonna miss the name, Lauren. It's the, my, the G-Jet, the G-Jet tube has a larger French diameter J-tube. So it's the same diameter in the G and the J. And so we have been able to give commercially blenderized products that are recommended for a 12 French or above or minimum of a 12 French through a J-tube that way. So yes to commercially available products, not so much to uh, homemade blends through the J-tube. And then if your G-tube is a 12 French, then it's really just the conversation with your GI provider or your surgeon to upsize the tube. And I think there were questions about like, well, what about the research on the 12 French? Why didn't you test those? Um, and it was because they didn't work well. Like, so in our initial testing, it was like, oh yeah, 12 French tubes aren't going to work with every recipe. So we kind of ruled them out. However, I will say we actually do have a, a population, you know, who got their tubes when they were babies, still have a 12 French tubes. And as long as they're not clogging their tube, if they're not volume intolerant and have a little bit thinner blend, we don't quote, require them to upsize. It just might mean that they might not be able to do the enchilada diet, the super thick blend, but that a thinner blend might work. So, um, you know, I think every place is gonna be different. Um, and then for us, for J tubes, you know, ideally, Again, we don't recommend it. However, um, as we start to have a bigger pra practice in the adult population with like gas status post gastric bypass surgery or status post total gastrectomy, you know, one could argue that feeding in the jejunum once the jejunum has a adapted is no different than eating orally after gastric bypass surgery or eating orally after a total gastrectomy. Um, and so we've started to be a little bit more okay with trialing. Um, but one thing that I feel like I'm just not really willing to bend on is the, the two hour hang time. So if you can get your feet in in two hours, then we can work with that. If your feed takes six hours, then um, we just don't have any evidence that adding ice packs or anything like that extends hang time. So um, I think that's going to be evolving, uh, evolving practice, and it's it's part of partly addressed in the Aspen recommendations as an evolving practice. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up. Unfortunately, there are dozens of questions. I appreciate everybody who answered, uh, Robin and, and Lauren and Robin, Lauren, Robin and Lisa, for addressing a lot of the questions we got during registration in your presentations. That was really helpful. Um, so I just, sorry, I just lost my notes again. Um, I just want to close up with a thank you. We really appreciate your all being here, your time um, and sharing of your expertise. We have some resources on our website about blenderized tube feeding. You can go to our resources link for tube feeding. Roz, I think we have a slide that gives some um, information about those. Thanks. So um, you can find information about blenderized tube feeding here. And also on this slide, you can see the, uh, the URL for the um, complete.com create new recipe. That's for the recipe builder that Lisa, that sorry, Robin was discussing. Um, and this concludes our, our webinar today. Again, thank you. And thanks to Nestle for um, sponsoring this webinar. We look forward to seeing you all again.